your direct reports may not have that visibility into broader initiatives or how initiatives are being received. So I always try to communicate, here's a priority that we have going on in another um, sort of department that is impacting the entire company, right? So we may be launching a big new company-wide sort of change. It's probably not the best time to launch a new learning program. Welcome to Making Better, a podcast from Better Everyday Studios devoted to helping small learning teams have a big impact. Today, I am talking to Stephanie Bertner, the head of learning and development at Pinterest. Steph is an expert at dealing with change, change of leadership, change of direction, she has seen it all. Since change is something we all deal with, I thought it would be great to have Steph on to discuss how she deals with change, especially when leading an L&D team. Let's dive in. Steph, good morning. Welcome to the Making Better podcast. How are you doing today? I am here. I'm alive. I'm well. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Yes, we are uh, recording pretty early to make sure we fit it into some schedules. So I definitely uh, probably uh, was a little bit more of a whirlwind uh, this morning than I'm used than I usually like to be, but we're here. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this a little bit early. Um, really excited for the conversation. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Absolutely. So um, we met. Uh, a few months ago, um, just because of some connections we have with where, where we've worked. Um, but I'm wondering for anybody that doesn't know you, if you could give us a quick quick rundown into your background, uh, who you are, how you got started, that kind of thing. Yeah, sounds good. So I've spent the past 15 years or so in the learning and talent development space and different industries like tech, advertising, entertainment. And I started my career in aviation. I work for uh, an airline called Virgin America when it was just a startup and really got into learning and development that way. So spent a lot of time in you know, frontline training, onboarding, flight attendants, guest service agents, thinking about you know, leadership development and aviation. So that really grew my love for learning and then transitioned into the tech space and haven't looked back since. Awesome, yeah, I think, um, yeah, you, you definitely have a background of kind of that tech startup world, which that that's a lot of my background as well, and um, it's definitely a very interesting space for for all things, but especially L and D, just because there, mm-hmm. there's there's so much change, and change is actually the specific reason that I wanted to have you on, uh, because especially over the past couple of years, you know, whether it's the startups that you've been in that are always going to be having a lot of change, or recently, you know, you you used to work at you used to work at Twitter, now you're in Pinterest, kind of starting a new role there, um, and so I really wanted to have you on to talk about change from an L&D perspective, because I think, you know, since we are a group of people that is, you know, so responsible for communicating information to a company, and that could be information about, you know, what your job function is, or what the company culture is, we are often, you know, handling onboarding for, for a company. And so a lot of that change has to kind of filter through us in, in certain ways. And so as someone who's seen a lot of change, um, I thought it'd be, be great to talk to you about, about that specific uh, idea. And so what I'd love to kind of start off with are, you know, when you're thinking about change um, and you know a big change is coming to affect the company or your team, what are the first things that you think about? Yeah, I think immediately where my head goes is how does this impact our team? I'm thinking about like, what programs do we have that are live? What work do we have on our roadmap? So I'm really thinking about, okay, how does this impact the team? And then thinking more specifically, like what is the change? Is it a budget cut? Is there an impending acquisition? Is it a leadership change? I think the type of change also really matters. Um, I'll talk about my experience specifically. I think it was a couple things right now. I know a lot of companies are cutting back on some of their budgets or um, slowing down hiring. So it's a bit of uh, like a pause phase. So, um, you know, I think about all right, what programs do we have that are running live that are still relevant? So when I think about manager development, like Manager skills are always going to be relevant. So that's probably not something that we're going to stop doing. But is there anything else that is really expensive? It's high touch. The team is putting a lot of work and energy and effort. And is this really going to yield the results that we need right now? So I'll give you an example. In my past life, we ran a lot of like high touch, very tailored leadership development programs that weren't cheap. And when I was thinking about sort of the, the, 
context in which I was operating in, budgets were pulling back, you know, we may have a new leadership team. Does it make sense to continue to invest in this program or can we reinvest in other areas and have a wider impact, right? So in that specific example, my team, we decided to pause that program and do something to support all managers. We did like a speaker series on leading through change, offered a coaching circle. So it was really about supporting a broader employee base during that time. And just thinking about what's the best use of sort of our time and money and effort. So one is really thinking about how is this going to impact our team? Like, are the programs still relevant? And then when I think about, you know, how do I communicate to my team? It's really about trying to offer as much clarity as I can. Sometimes I don't have the answers and I tell my team that I'm like, look, I don't know where this is going, but I want to share with you what I do know. There's a lot we don't, but there are things that we do know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love how you answered that because I think it really speaks to the importance of being proactive. I think mm -hmm. a lot of times when you hear about change, it can be very threatening and defensive. You know, people will mm -hmm. get defensive and you pull mm -hmm. back and it's almost kind of like you're waiting for the shoe to drop and mm -hmm. seeing what's going to happen. Um, whereas what you said is just like, okay, as soon as you hear some change, you know, especially if it's going to be something around a uh, budget, which a lot of people are probably seeing in the last few months or year is, um, immediately you going to like, okay, so what, what should we, what should we do here? How do we prioritize things? What are we going to cut when you act in that proactive fashion? Um, have you, or, you know, and obviously everything in life is aspirational. We're all, we're all saying like what we want to do versus what we maybe do do. Um, are you trying to like, do you put together a plan that you then bring to your boss and say like, Hey, these things are happening. Like, here's kind of what, what I would suggest we do. Um, or is it more that you've been asked for those plans and then you provide them and it, yeah. Yeah. It's usually a recommendation because you know, I think a lot of a lot of teams and learning and development, like they have their ears on the ground. Like you hear what's happening in training sessions. You know, sometimes managers will reach you know out to the learning team because they're that's who they've interacted with during onboarding, right? So I feel like you know both learning and HRVPs really have this opportunity to have an ear an ear on the ground. So a lot of the times it's me, you know, hearing from my team what's happening and providing a recommendation with that example that I just gave you. I'm like, look, I don't think these programs are really going to land um, right now within this context. What do you think about X, Y, and Z and how, how that might land? So definitely providing a recommendation, sharing with my leader and getting, getting sign off there before, you know, moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. I I think, and I've, I've been talking to a couple people about this the last few weeks, I feel like something that comes up a lot because like you said, learning folks, HRBPs, we really do have a good pulse of the company a lot of times because mm -hmm. when we're doing our best work, we're out there in the business, interacting with people on the ground, really, really getting a sense of, of what's happening. And I at least have found in almost every company I've worked with, there is at a disconnect at some level where there's the like what the people on the ground need mm -hmm. and what leadership whether that be it's usually not frontline manager it's usually like somewhere between manager and director level or, mm -hmm. or maybe it's up at the executive level but what leadership at some level thinks the people on the ground need when you are looking at these prioritizations does that how much does that factor into your thinking in terms of, and what I mean by that is, you know, say like it's a really, really high touch expensive program. Maybe it's, you know, like executive coaching or something like that, mm -hmm. which is usually extremely expensive. And I don't know if that's what it was, but I'm just giving an example of something that comes to mind. Would you ever consider like keeping a program that maybe doesn't f seem to make as much sense to you from when you're looking out at the ground, but you know, it's just got you know, it's got a ton of executive buy-in. It's seen mm -hmm. as really important by by certain people, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's always a balance there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there's always a balance. And when I think about programs that my team builds or that we run, I always try to meet somewhere in the middle, right? It's like, what is going to what is really important to our leadership team? What's going to drive the business? What's a priority for them? And blending it with like, what are we actually hearing that folks need? And I often see this in like manager development, you know, 
leadership team wants to make sure we're really driving certain behaviors or competencies. And we know that there's some more specific sort of skill gaps, right? So whenever I create training or a new initiative, it really tries to blend both, like, like the push and the pull. Um, so I'm a pretty bal. I think like to say that I'm a pretty balanced person, and that shows up too in in the work that I do in learning. <laughs> yeah, that that totally yeah. makes sense, and I and I think you're spot on. Is that you know it's just it is always about that balance. Mm -hmm. of, you know, it's not about dying on the hill of defending the the one side, and it's not about selling out and just going with leadership all the time. It's kind of like you know finding that finding that middle ground for sure. Um, and so as you're doing these part, this prioritization and you're kind of deciding what to keep and what to get rid of, I'm guessing sometimes that starts to get to, you know, if say there's a person on your team and their whole job is this mm. program and you've determined that this program isn't really going to work. Now, maybe, maybe that affects their job. Maybe it doesn't, you know, but how do you go about talking to your team about that? in terms of, you know, how do you keep them from getting super defensive? How do, yeah, how, how do you have that discussion? I like to engage people sort of early and often and explain sort of what's on the horizon, right? So, um, you know, I had a specific example in my past life where a person on my team focused really on targeted programs for, for specific audiences. So this might look like a women's leadership development program. This might look like a um, career development program for underrepresented talent, all which are incredibly important. But given some of like budget pullbacks, um, you know, we weren't going to have the budget that we had in, in the past. It was just a conversation. It was like, look, hey, things are changing right now. We're probably not going to have the same money that we did. What do you think about the scenario and what do, what do you think that we should do? So it's more of a discussion to get their input rather than, hey, we're pausing these programs. We're going to put you on something mm. else. I like to try to bring my team in early and often and like, let's think through this together and also help explain my thinking um around the the way that i'm leaning you know in the past example i gave i'm like i think we can impact more people across the company and have a larger impact if we think about our budget and our programs differently now so what what do you think about that so it's really trying to get alignment in their input early on because i mean for a lot of people you know that is their whole job it's a lot of you know what they care about and what they're passionate about and doesn't mean we're not going to have those programs again it just means not now yeah yeah i think or sorry go ahead nope mm -hmm. oh, okay um yeah i think that really again it goes back to that proactive piece and it reminds me of uh leadership tip that i heard years ago that said something like you know managers are not communicated to they're communicated through and mm -hmm. kind of your whole goal should be to just be seamlessly passing information to your team as you receive it, rather than always seeing yourself as kind of an arbiter <laughs> of, of information. Um, sure. Yeah. And so when you're having those discussions, I something that just came up, came to mind as, as you were talking about that, what are some of the most common things you find that you kind of have to coach people on? Uh, when maybe there are newer team members, you're looking at things from this kind of 30,000 foot view of what's best for the company as a whole. They're focused on that, on their particular program. Um, yeah. What are some of the more common things you have to coach people on to kind of get their heads wrapped around this, th these larger ideas? Mm -hmm. For sure. I think, uh, that comes a lot back. It comes back to my role as a manager to yeah. communicating like what's happening across, across the business, right? Because your direct reports may not have that visibility into broader initiatives or how initiatives are being received. So I always try to communicate, like, even though it might not be directly related to their role, it's like, look, here's a priority that we have going on in another um, sort of department that is impacting the entire company, right? So we may be launching a big new company-wide sort of change, it's probably not the best time to launch a new learning program, right? We're all coming from the same team. When we think about our audience, we we should be thinking about, all right, what's the right timing? Does this fit together? So I, what I like to do is just pass down some of the other key initiatives that may, you know, impact who our audience is. Um, 
that's a lot of a lot of what I do when I'm thinking about coaching my team is just giving them more visibility, even though it may not be directly related to what they're doing. It does impact um, some of the work and how you know some of our programs will be received. <clears throat> I love that. It's kind of it goes back to just that idea of like focusing on the customer mm -hmm, and really being mm -hmm. like using that. In, in past companies that I've worked with, that was always where we tried to draw motivation from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the company as a whole might be thinking about that in terms of the end customer. Mm -hmm. But for us as support teams, our customers are the people in the business. And so right. just reminding people of who we're really here to support, what we're really here to do, and using that as a way to kind of like just simplify the conversation and focus yeah. in on making sure you're, you're doing what makes sense. That, that, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so then when you're having those conversations too, obviously I think one of the things that can be really difficult with change is it can be super demotivating to people sometimes, you know, especially if you have some big goal, maybe there's a program that you've been mm -hmm. working on for months and you're like right on the verge of roll out. And then you have to like, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, how do you think about motivating your, your team in times like that? Oh, yeah, that is so disappointing when you've worked so hard on a project or a program. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. How do I think about motivation? Um, <laughs> it really depends on the person. Uh, sure. Definitely. definitely um, it depends on the person. It also depends on like what the program is. Did they, did they build it themselves, right? Did they go and like build the training and are facilitating it? Um, all, all of that matters. So when I think about motivation, um, I think about like how, how else might I motivate them? Is there another project that I can put them on that really taps into kind of their purpose, what they care about? Um, and, you know, like we just talked about, how do we, how do we get focused on what the customer is, right? While we may not move forward with that program that we built, like how else can we position the work that they're doing in support of the broader company and support of employees? Um, and I think when I think about motivation, I really like to understand what my team members care about. Um, have you heard of the concept called job crafting? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so it's it really about building roles that like tap into sort of people's okay. motivation okay. And, and their skills. Like I really subscribe to that idea of creating roles and putting people on projects that like tap into what they really care about. Um, so like, for example, we might not launch that big leadership program, but we are doing something else to support our manager. So I might put the person on leadership development on that new initiative. Um, so really tapping into what they care about and sort of their innate sense of purpose and sort of why they, why do they show up, um, day to day. <clears throat> that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now I know I didn't, I didn't prep you to say that I was going to ask this, so this might okay. not go well. And so if, if you don't have an answer to it, I totally understand and we can cut Sounds it out. <laughs> um, but it would be great if, do you, when you think back, do you have an example of maybe some point in, in your history where there was a change that happened that you didn't deal with very well or didn't make great decisions and then, and kind of what lessons you learned and then how did that turn into an example of a change that happened that you did, you do feel you, you dealt with well. Mm, change. Gosh. Um, didn't go well. Um, uh, yeah, I think a, a, a recent example is, um, <laughs> is, um, around like understanding organizational capacity, like what the, um, the company is ready and has capacity for, right? Mm. Um, meaning like learning and development may have a program that they want to launch, an initiative that they, they want to drive um, and not really consider all the other things that might be going on in the business. So mm. it could be a sp specific time during the year, maybe it's budget planning or, um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, a, a busy time in the advertising space, right? Where there's a lot of customer 
type of focus. I think I don't have a specific example, but I know earlier in my career, I really didn't consider all the other things going on in the business when thinking yeah. about launching and delivering learning and development programs. And that really eats at people's capacity to be present. It really eats at people's um, capacity to take the learnings back into their day to day. So I think just like broader lesson there is, you know, really working with HR business partners. If you all have HR business partners in your organization, it's working with leaders to understand the cadence of what's going on in the company, busy times versus not so busy times. Probably not a good idea to launch a program in July and August in EMEA when people are <laughs> out on PTO, right? So yeah. I think um, that's one of the lessons that I've learned over time, really thinking about what's going on in the, uh, in the company and their overall capacity to um, absorb new programs. <clears throat> That's that's so great because it really speaks back to this idea of change and kind of even if the change isn't affecting the learning team or it's not affecting your budgets, if there's big organizational change, it, even if you could, it might not be a good time to launch that program. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. if there's a huge, if there's a massive reorg happening in one in one part of the company or the whole company, um, even if you could do something, it doesn't mean you should. Yeah. At, a, at a super micro level, I remember at the last company I worked at, it was the first company that had a real like sales team mm -hmm. um, where there were a lot of AEs and stuff, and so I was doing training for them. And I remember trying to schedule. Uh, a bunch of interviews to to get to get a, a course off the ground. Um, don't schedule interviews the last with salespeople the last <laughs> week of the month, or certainly not the last week of the quarter, because yeah. they will ignore you. <laughs> yeah, for sure, definitely. <laughs> yeah, um, that was <laughs> that was a good lesson learned for me. Awesome. Well, um, any other final thoughts that you have around around change and managing change from, from an L&D perspective, Steph? Definitely. I think the biggest thing that I've learned, too, is to shorten your time horizon. So meaning like, you know, when we think about planning, we're thinking about year two down, years down the road to shorten the time horizon. It's like, all right, six months from now, what can we commit to? Um, and just take baby steps that way. I think that is one thing that really helped my team succeed and, you know, feel like, all right, cool. We've got some wins here. We have visibility a few months down the road. Um, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. We'll reassess six months later, see how it goes. So time horizon is, uh, shortening that is really important. That is awesome. I love that as just kind of an answer to all of this stuff is just like when change happens, just, you know, whether it's to help push motivation, help keep people focused is just pull back that time horizon. I, lo I love that because you don't you don't know what's going to be on the other side. And rather than worrying about it, just focus on what you do know. I think that mm -hmm. that's that's so fantastic. Uh, well, that's a great spot to end, Steph. So thank you so much for being here this morning. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you liked the discussion, make sure to hit like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. As a reminder, if your team is struggling keeping up with the training development demands of your organization, we want to help. Better Everyday Studios is a full service instructional design team that can help you with everything from ideation to actual content creation and delivery. Please reach out to us using the link in the episode notes below. Have a great day.